you do. Um, has a little skin tag or a mole or w worried about a skin cancer. And so, um, I just so first of all, I want to welcome back Hope, Hope Mers. Hi. Nursing, you know, she's a nurse practitioner with about 10 years experience as a dermatology expert. So she brings a lot of value to, uh, to you. She brings a lot of value to our practice as well. So I'm going to turn it over today. Um, well, Hope, let me ask you something real quickly. What have you been doing? What have you been doing while you've been uh, home? <laughs> I've been writing a lot of stuff, getting some things ready for when we come back and, you know, just putzing around the house, I guess. You know, what else can you do? Yeah, it's uh, definitely, I definitely hope we get back in three weeks or whatever it is or sooner. But um, anyway, all right, well, let's do this. So I'm going to turn this over to you. And um, in fact, I'm going to turn the whole thing over to you here. I'm going to try to share my screen here with your presentation, and um, and you can take it away, and I will be happy mm -hmm. to assist you with um, anything I can do with regards to uh, advancing the slides and so forth. So go for it. All right, perfect. Okay, so hi everybody. I know everyone out there has at least one type of a lump or a bump. So today I'm going to go through the most common dermatological lesions and what you can do to remove them or suppress them. So um, first thing we're going to talk about in our fun with lumps and bumps presentation is moles. So on your screen there, you can see there's a few different pictures there of different moles. Moles come in all shapes, all sizes. Some of them are raised, some of them are flat. Some of them you have from a baby, some pop up when you're older. And um, there's a couple different methods that we use to remove them. Uh, sometimes you don't want to remove them and you wanna leave them and that's fine too, as long as they are growing healthily and regularly and all of that type of thing. But um, if we can advance to the next slide, there's a few different elements that you want to look for when you're evaluating a mole. And um, this picture here shows a few irregular moles, which are kind of more obvious to the eye that they're not growing as they should be. But we like to say that there's the A, B, C, D, E's of moles. E was added recently within the last few years, but A is for asymmetry. So when you look at a mole and you're trying to decide if it's totally fine or if it might be something that we want to watch, and monitor or cut out, you wanna look for these few things. So asymmetry means that one side of the mole doesn't look exactly like the other side. And it's okay if they're a little bit different, you know, not every mole is perfect, but if you have a good amount of asymmetry, like you see in that photo there, where one side's bumped up, the other side's flat, or one side has a jagged border and one side doesn't, that might be a trigger sign uh, the next thing, the B stands for border irregularity. So you can see there in that photo that there's a bit of a scalloped edge to that mole. And, um, you know, typically you want it to be smooth, at least sort of smooth. It doesn't have to be perfect again, but any type of real jagged edge is also something that we might take into consideration. Uh, C stands for color. So in general, you want your moles on your body to be kind of similar. So say you have all tan moles and then you have one really dark mole. That's gonna be a little bit more irregular than if all of your moles were dark. Then that might be totally fine. The other thing you wanna look with color is, are there more than one color within a mole? Now, sometimes you can have a little bit of tan, a little bit of brown, and that's totally fine. But if you have multiple variations of color, that is also a warning sign that it might be something that we want to take another look at. So the D in the ABCDEs of moles stands for diameter. In general, you want your moles to be ideally less than a pencil eraser or five millimeters. Now, if you've had a mole your whole life that's bigger, that's usually fine. Um, if you have a mole that's small and then you look at it years later and it's all of a sudden twice the size, that's a little bit of a warning sign as well. So we want to take those into consideration. 
that kind of goes into evolution, the E in the ABCDEs. E, so evolution, that means your mole is changing. Once you have a mole, it typically doesn't change when you're an adult. Now, if you're a child and you have a mole that's the size of a pencil eraser and by the time you're 20 years old, it will grow with you. So it will be bigger by the time you're an adult. But if a mole pops up when you're 25, it should not be growing and you shouldn't notice it much different by the time you're 40. So if a mole has changed in size, color, appearance, uh, we should take that also into consideration. And you might have some of these, you know, a little asymmetric, a little bit variation in color, and that's fine. But this is what we look at when we're evaluating on a full body exam to trigger our minds to maybe look at that mole a little closer. So a way that we can look closer as practitioners is use a microscope. So Dr. Mendelson likes to make fun of my derm dermatoscope that I carry around with me at work, but it's a great little tool. I'm able to put it up to your skin and the mole and evaluate the pigment pattern. So there's different pigment patterns within a mole that are normal and some that trigger a little bit of questioning. So if I see something that looks suspicious, I can take a biopsy, which is super easy. I just use a little bit of lidocaine underneath the skin and it numbs right away. It also has a little epinephrine in that mixture and the epinephrine makes it so it doesn't bleed. And then we shave the mole and typically actually that will get rid of most moles appearance. So usually after that, if the mole is normal, you won't see anything on your skin again. Sometimes the color does come back through and we have to cut it out, but I'll go over that as well. Um, so I send that specimen to a dermatopathologist. He only reads skin. So he is excellent, his team in reading uh, skin lesion samples. I've sent to the same dermatopathology office for 10 years and uh, they're very, very trustworthy. And so I'll call you within a week Someone will, one of our team members will call you within a week and let you know what you need to do, if anything at all. And so it's a real easy procedure. And if you have anything you're worried about, you can always send me a photo and I'll look and say, yeah, come in, let's look at that a little closer or no, you know, we'll just keep on your normal monitoring schedule. But so those are the A, B, C, D, E is and what you can look for while you're sitting at home and, you know, send me a photo if you'd like to. But we'll kind of move on to the next slide. Hope, can you hear me at all or no? Uh-huh. Okay. Can um, I just ask you real quickly, you just mentioned, I know that this is more about the lesions, but you mentioned the procedure in terms of things not bleeding, and you mentioned epinephrine. And real quickly, just uh, could you just review the difference between what's in the solution, the lidocaine and epinephrine, just so people understand what that means? Sure. So when we do numbing, we have a few different ways to numb, whether we're doing the skin or a different type of procedure. Um, with shave excisions, which I'll go into in a minute, or surgical excisions, we typically use an injectable numbing. So it's a solution that we pull up and we use a teeny tiny needle to poke underneath the skin and you feel one quick little poke, but that's it. The lidocaine is the numbing agent and that is what works immediately. It, the area is gonna be numb. The epinephrine is what's called a vasoconstrictor. So it constricts the little tiny vessels that are in your skin layers and makes them so they're not going to bleed during your procedure. And uh, so it makes it a virtually bloodless procedure and easy for us and you. And so the combo of the two is what we use. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so this shows the two most common procedures when we're removing a skin lesion. So the first is called a shave excision. Uh, shave is where if you have a lesion that's very superficial, very shallow, so a lot of the times a mole. And uh, once we numb it with that injectable solution that we were talking about, we take a little flat instrument and we can just shave that mole right off. It's a very shallow, even though in that photo it looks like there's a divot, it's a very, very shallow uh, procedure. So it'll look like you kind of picked a pimple afterwards. It's not going to leave a mark. Um, if you look very, very closely, you might see something very tiny, but uh, typically you can't even tell it was done after it heals. And so after we do the procedure, 
I usually put a little ointment and a Band-Aid and you leave with that. You change that once a day and that heals up within a few days. So it's, it's really a simple procedure. I have a lot of patients and myself. I've taken moles off of myself as well. But, um, you know, you get those little bumps on your skin, on your face. And sometimes those are just little genetic lesions that happen that someone passed down to you. And a bump on your skin will bother a lot of people. So it's a really quick and easy procedure to get rid of those. The second illustration that you saw in that slide, that previous one, was surgical excision. So that we use the same type of numbing and uh, we will make a little bit of a football marking around a mole if we're gonna remove it that way. This is typically better for a, a mole or a different type of lesion that goes deeper. So uh, if you have something that goes into the deeper layers of the skin, a shave excision won't get it off all the way. So what we wanna do is just cut out that segment of skin. And so what we do is we use that same kind of numbing, it works right away. And we have a marking that looks kind of like a little football. We call that an, ellip an ellipse incision. So we're going to mark a little bit of a football around the mole. We cut that out and then we put a few sutures. Those sutures stay the stitches for about one week and then we remove them and you're done. There goes your mole or your other lump or bump that we were removing. So also another simple procedure, we give beautiful results um, after a surgical excision. So we need to do that that's a great option as well so this slide is illustrating a few of the most common lumps and bumps we see that are treated with shave excision that shallow excision we were talking about that first one that i went over so seborrheic keratoses <clears throat> these are uh, benign they're okay they look like little crusty bumps sometimes they're not as as thick as this and not as obvious that that's what they are but a lot of people think they're moles and um, they're really just skin cells stacked on top of each other. And we take that flat little instrument and we just shave them off. Sometimes I'll use some liquid nitrogen also if they're on the flatter side to freeze them down. So that's an option. Periangiomas, so those look like little red bumps. They have a root system underneath them. So that little vascular root system kind of feeds them and creates this little bump. We will, I can usually shave excise those and get rid of them. Sometimes if they're a little bigger, a little bit more vascular, we will do that surgical excision method where we cut out the segment of skin. So uh, skin tags, very common, very common around the neck. These usually pop up in areas of friction. So the neck, women wear necklaces a lot or um, collared shirts tend to do that as well. The area under the arms just from running and rubbing but they do also pop up genetically. So some people are more uh, predisposed to those, but same kind of way that we remove them, that little tiny poke of numbing, uh, sometimes on the little tiny ones, I can use just some numbing cream, let that sit 10 minutes and then take them off and you won't feel that at all. So those are the most common, I would say for shaves are the moles in these three here. Mm -hmm. And then our next slide illustrates, so cyst. So cyst is a lump within the skin. It feels like it's under the skin because it's kind of under that surface of skin. But that is kind of like a little sack. So it has a wall, has a wall around it, and then it has some contents within it, some skin cells, some oil, different things. Typically, these are benign. Usually, they're OK. You don't have to cut them out, but a lot of people are bothered by the look of them. They do tend to grow. So even if you're not bothered with them when they're little, eventually you will be and they can become infected so when they get infected or inflamed they're tender they have to be drained it's not a fun thing to go through so sometimes it's just better to cut them out and be done and not have to worry about them later so what we do is we numb around that whole cyst that you see there uh, with that same injectable little tiny poke you feel at first and that's it we make an incision over top of that lump that you see and then we have to pull out that whole sack so that that whole wall we we get out of there because if you just re remove part of it or drain the lump it's going to grow back because you have to get the little wall out so once we pull that whole uh, sack out we put a few little stitches few little sutures and then those stay in about a week and that's it so um yeah, cysts, cysts are very common. The most common ones are sebaceous and epidermoid, but they happen all over the body and um, 
they are really common. We cut those out a lot. So those are a common lump and bump. And next you'll see uh, lipoma, I think. Lipoma is, so lipoma is underneath the skin. So this is kind of like a clumping of fat. It's just a benign tumor of fat. It sits under the skin. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they can get pretty good size and um, they feel more squishy and soft. They can happen anywhere. We remove them in a similar fashion to the cyst. So the numbing, little incision, get out that clump of fat and then suture that closed. And um, those, are, those are pretty common and really nice when you get rid of them because they can be pretty bothersome. They're usually not painful, but sometimes if they're larger, they can put a little pressure on underlying structures and cause some pain. So um, we cut those out too as well. Another common lump and bump. All right. Okay, so these are illustrations of things that we typically will treat with or commonly treat with surgical excisions. Dermatofibroma is kind of like a little scar in the skin. They're typically created by some type of puncture injury. So they're really common on the lower leg from like mosquito bites. They're common on the arms. Um, we actually took one of these out of Hillary, one of our, one of our staff at advanced and um it looks great she's so happy because it was a lump on her leg and she would shave over it and it just got caught and it would you know nick and bleed and so we numb that just do the little football surgical elliptical incision around it and a few sutures and then that's gone this plastic nevi so that refers to an irregular mole the upper right hand photo that you see it's not easy to tell in that picture that it's irregular but that is typically what a dysplastic mole will look like. It's not obviously irregular like those previous photos we, sh we showed with the ABCDEs. It's usually just, it's like, is it bad? And then you look at it up close and it's like, yeah, it might be a little bit irregular. So dysplastic nevi just means that a mole is not growing as it should be. It's not growing as perfectly as it should. It might have a little bit of dysplasia or mutations within it that can progress to a melanoma eventually. It might never, but it might. So it's better just to cut them out, get rid of that segment of skin and not have to worry about it. So that's another common one we'll do. Um, skin cancers like basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, those are the two most common uh, non-melanoma types of skin cancers. And they usually occur on areas that are sun exposed because they are from UV radiation. So the face, the neck, the hands, forearms, uh, chest, real common areas for those. And um, I had one cut out of my temple. Sometimes we will work in conjunction with a Mohs surgeon with these. So Mohs surgery is where a Mohs surgeon has a specialty where they will remove a skin cancer little bit by little bit, usually on the face. Because if you have a skin cancer on your face, you want the littlest bit of skin removed so that you can have the best incision line, the best result cosmetically possible. So sometimes we'll refer to a Mohs surgeon to make sure all of that skin cancer is removed and they take the segment, they go look under a microscope, they're like, oh no, there's a little bit on this edge. They'll come back, take that little bit off that edge of skin and then say, okay, you're good, there's no more skin cancer. And then you come to us and our team will surgically close that area as cosmetically as possible. So that's also something that we'll sometimes do. Um, scars, so that bottom right hand photo is showing you a hypertrophic or a keloid scar. Um, the difference between the two, uh, mm. Dr. Bendelson, I know would like me to describe so a hypertrophic scar is just the thickening, a scar that got a little bit thicker, that's still in the area of where the wound was. A keloid is... Hope I, we lost you for a moment. The scar grew beyond the wound. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, what'd you say, Dr. Mendelson? We, we actually lost the, uh, say that again if you would. We lost your audio right as you were describing the critical difference between the keloid and the, sorry about that. That's okay. So there's a little bit of a difference. So a hypertrophic scar is something, it's a scar that grows where you had that initial 
wound. So wherever you had that initial scratch or scrape or acne or whatever, the hypertrophic scar is just a thickened scar right there in that area. A keloid is a, a thickened scar that will grow beyond the initial wound. So say you have a little pimple on your chest and you get this three inch scar from where that little pimple was, that's more of a keloid. So the scar kind of grew, grew beyond the initial wound. And that's something that we'll take into consideration when we revise the scar cosmetically, we will follow you closely. So we make sure that that doesn't happen again. We might use some injectable medicines um, serially, so in a row every month or so to make sure that that incision doesn't overgrow like it did before. So we do that commonly as well. And only because I always have to say something about this, um, many, many patients come in, we talk about doing a blepharoplasty or facelift or any, any sort of uh, surgical procedure, and one of the questions that we get commonly are, you know, I'm a keloid former, that's what we'll hear. So my question then will be, well, uh, tell me about it, where is it? Well, it's from my C-section, or it's from my shoulder surgery or knee surgery. Um, so first of all, the face is generally very forgiving in terms of healing. It's very vascular. We get away with a lot, meaning it just, it, it heals well. Um, and I'm only repeating what, what Hope said, but many, many physicians will tell you that you, you're a keloid former. That's not true. So for any of you who really want to understand the difference, if you've been told that you've had, uh, you're a keloid former, it may be true. But I would jump online and look at keloids. Keloids are more common in the African-American population. You'll commonly see, just from an ear piercing, just a large area that continues to grow, just like Hope said, outside the confines of where the original wound was. If you have a C-section and it's an ugly scar and you don't like it, that's a hypertrophic scar. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be addressed and that you like it. But uh, and the treatment initially may be similar. It might be injecting with uh, either Kenalog or 5-FU or some, some formulation. It might be serial, S-E-R-I-A-L, multiple injections along the way. The, the risk with keloids are, well, we got Siri talking to us. We, the risk with keloids, though, are that they are more challenging. You really need to follow up. So let's say we remove it, and let's say we're seeing you back. A very common situation is that You'll see me back for the first, or you'll hope back for the first appointment. Everything's great. Maybe three months later, you'll see us back. But then you think everything's fine, and the next time we see you is a year and a half later where your keloid has returned. So this is a big thing, and we have a lot of doctors who refer patients in who say that this is a keloid, and it's not. So um, that's something that we'll spend some time on, but most people in areas of the trunk or where there's tension, these areas that I'm talking about, might develop hypertrophic, maybe ugly looking scars. To you, they're just as bad, but we might treat them slightly differently. So I just wanted to say that. I hope knew I would jump in there. All right. All right. So moving on, I'm switching modes a little bit to some non-surgical things here. Um, the next slide that you see is discussing cautery. So I use, uh, we use something called a hyfricator to treat sometimes little tiny lesions that um, don't necessarily need to have a shave or a surgical excision. And this is a process called cauterization or cautery. A couple common lesions, uh, milia, I know is a very well-known term. These are just little kind of clogged pores. They happen everywhere on the face and, you know, instead of, Sometimes we'll take a little instrument and poke a hole in them and kind of express the contents of what's in there so that that skin will go down and you lose that bump. Sometimes they're so small that, uh, and there's so many that we don't need, we don't necessarily want to do that to all of those. So we'll use something called cautery. This is just, it looks like a little a pen and it has a disposable tip. That tip heats up and it just gently burns the top of those areas. So they'll look like you have little tiny crusts when you leave the office. Uh, you can put a little ointment on those and they heal quickly within a couple of days. You can't even tell anything was done. You do usually, I mean, you want to avoid the sun with most procedures, but especially on the face when we're doing something we don't want, we don't want to risk any hyperpigmentation. So I'll discuss that uh, a little bit as well. 
in our skin, we have the ability to produce melanin with any type of procedure. Melanin can stay in the skin, and we refer to that as a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. It's like your melanin is trying to protect that, that wound, that injury, even if it's a tiny injury. We want to protect that wound, our skin does. So in order to avoid the hyperpigmentation, we ask that you just wear your sunscreen, wear a hat, make sure that you're keeping that sun off of you as much as possible. Darker skin tones do have a high, higher risk of hyperpigmentation. So um, we also will take that into consideration. Sometimes we'll do a cream, a prescription cream on you a couple weeks before your procedure just to suppress your skin's wanting to send out that melanin and um, prevent that hyperpigmentation response. But just quickly, I wanted to mention that. So milia are a common uh, skin lump that we treat with cautery. During gomas, these happen around the eyes. They're more genetic, and I do see those every once in a while, so I wanted to put those up there because a lot of the times people don't know um, what those are and they want to treat them. So going on to the next slide, I had actually a few staff members say, put this in there because we I mean, patients get these all the time. They come in with these and no one knows what they are. And so sebaceous hyperplasia, it's a big term for these tiny little bumps that get so annoying on the face. I get them around my nose just from, it's, it's from kind of like an oily skin. I, I'm dry in general, but uh, around here, I wear glasses every once in a while and um, my oil accumulates under where those glasses sit. So I get these. These are very common in oily skin types though. They are growths around the pore. They look like a pink kind of yellowy, almost like a little donut if you look at them up close. And, um, you know, they treat really well with cautery. I usually will do one, but plan on doing multiple and um, we'll see how, how your lesions respond. It depends on the thickness of them and just how your skin heals as to how many you might need to reduce these. But usually I'll, I'll treat once and then have you come back in a month. We'll look, be like, oh yeah, we still got some here, some there. Let's go ahead and treat those. Sometimes people have one and we'll just shave it off and be done with it. Sometimes you have multiple and they're little. And so cautery is the best answer for that. Uh, Retin-A and retinol does help prevent them. Uh, a lot of the times they'll burst through anyway. And so, you know, uh, dermaplaning and chemical peels can help reduce them when they're small. But if they grow larger, like you see on this woman's forehead here, uh, typically we do have to go in and treat with a little bit of heat, a little bit of cautery. So that's a common one. Okay, so actinic keratosis is something I wanted to mention because a lot of men and women have these and they're not exactly aware of what they are. They might think that they're dry skin that just doesn't go away and really they should be addressed. So I wanted to show a brief little bit on these. So these are from sun damage. They are considered to be precancerous. So over the years, about 1% of them can turn into a squamous cell carcinoma, which is something that does continue to grow and is malignant. So we do have to remove that. But if we just freeze them off early, or there are some uh, topical creams that you can treat with them if there's a few in a small area. Um, but those I, I do like to, I like to go ahead and treat. So I'll do those a lot of the times. And sometimes I'll have someone come to me and say, hey, I've got this, they can look brown sometimes. I've got this brown spot and I wanna get rid of it. And actually it's a, it's a little precancer and I can tell by looking through a microscope, but also um, the feel of it, they feel kind of scaly. So that's something that I can use cautery, shave or liquid nitrogen depending on the lesion. But if you've had a little red spot that doesn't seem to be going away or red brown and it kind of feels a little scaly, you, you might wanna let me look at it so that um, we can treat those. I think that might be it. So that was fun with lumps and bumps. If you have a particular lump or bump you want us to look at, feel free to email a photo or um, upload it to our portal. And you know, after this lockdown, we can also take a look in person and let you know what exactly we need. Anything you can think of, Dr. Mendelson, that I missed? That was great. I, I jumped in with my keloid and my hypertrophic scars. Um, yeah. Yeah, during this, uh, what'd you call it? Did you call it a lockdown? I don't know if it's a, a lockdown. Yeah. 
I feel like I'm one of them. Yeah, it's getting uh, quite long. Um, but. Um, but uh, just a reminder with the virtual consultations, even for, uh, if, if, well, even for skin lesions, um, we're happy to see you. The process is really easy. Just um, 351face.com is uh, just go to the homepage where we're doing a lot of things, but there's a little button, virtual consultation, click on it. Really, it's just your name and email and the best time to reach you. And we're doing these um, seven days a week right now just so we can uh, be accessible. Uh, we know it's gonna be uh, crazy busy when we, when we get going again. Also, I just mentioned that there is uh, imminently, well, at least uh, fairly imminently, uh, you'll likely be receiving an email. Uh, there's also some promotions that are going on with Botox and fillers that, um, that we're putting together. And um, anyway, so we hope everybody's staying healthy and finding something to do. Enjoy the day today. It's beautiful. I know weather's uh, going to chill out a little bit here, cool off a little bit, at least this weekend. For those of you, uh, I mean, we'll be back um, every day here, but um, for those that celebrate Easter, I hope uh, everybody has a nice Easter celebration. It'll be certainly different. And for those of you who celebrate Passover, that starts tonight. Um, so we also uh, wish you well. So anyway, Hope, any other words? I think that's it. Okay. Hope you enjoyed it. Much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Hope. Bye.